Well, good morning, everyone. Um, can everyone see the, uh, okay, so I've got everybody muted and the procedure, let me close the door of my office. So what we'll be doing today is um, you're, everybody is muted. If you need to uh, uh, ask a question, you can um, raise your hand. There's a raise hand function. If you go to the, 
well, if you need to ask a question, press your space bar and speak, and that'll be like a, a walkie-talkie, and you'll get a, uh, you know, you'll be able to speak while the space bar is depressed, and then as soon as you let go, you'll, you'll go on mute again. Can somebody please tell me uh, whether that you can see the Team Project Milestone 3 screen uh, displayed? No, sir. All right. Hang on. Thank you. Let's see. Okay, can you see that now? Yes. Okay, great. So this is uh, concerning team, team Project Milestone 3, which is due on the 3rd, so in four days. And as I said earlier, I've changed the requirements for this to drop the uh, long report that was originally part of this. Instead of doing that, I, I want each team to prepare an extended abstract of you know, no more than 750, maybe a little bit more words, depending on what you need. And that uh, extended um, abstract should contain, contain the following information, as it says written here. You introduce and explain the topic briefly. So we're working on, for example, uh, our team is uh, investigating the impacts of invasive species uh, uh, and the changes due to climate change. And this is important because they damage uh, local ecosystems and harm um, property, et cetera. Um, so the outline should explain the topic and it should mention the scientific basis that you're reporting on and the, and the importance for society. And then an outline of how you'll present the material. So who will be doing an introductory presentation, who will uh, be presenting the different uh, topics um, in the, in the on-class presentation. And then you need a bulletized list of facts and scientific facts, findings that are going to be in part of your, of your presentation. And so each, um, you can just make a list of, of <clears throat> bullets, as many list bullets as you need, and there should probably be at least one bullet for every um, uh, source that you're going to have in your bibliography. So such a list might look like this. Um, bullet number one, climate change is increasing the frequency of impacts from invasive species, Smith and Jones 2017. So this is a peer-reviewed paper, Smith and Jones 2017, is published in a scientific journal. And then here would be another bulletized list. Miami reports impacts from iguana invasive species. And then you would recite the author, and this would, in this case, would be the reporter who wrote the story and the year that they wrote the story. Um, so that would be this bulletized list. And then you'll conclude with a paragraph or so with conclusions and recommendations that are going to be part of your presentation. And finally, there'll be a bibliography, and this will be a formatted bibliography. Um, using the following format, so uh, uh, listed by uh, first author, last name. So that would be the, the author name, the year of publication, and then the source. So in the case of the Miami uh, report from Miller, 2020, this would be Miller P. I don't know what, this is a made up name, of course. Uh, the date is 2020, and the source is the Miami Herald, uh, 25th January, 2020 edition. Um, and then for the Smith and Jones scientific paper, that would be Smith A. Jones D. 2017. So the names of the, um, of the uh, authors, uh, last name, first initial, and then the journal name. The issue number, so every journal has an issue number, and then the page number. And so you would have this for all of the uh, citations in your bibliography. And remember that you're obliged to use at least 10 peer review uh, sources and uh, at least seven uh, popular sources from the web or for newspaper accounts. So that would be the extended abstract. And then you're gonna prepare a slide deck. There's gonna be no more than 18 slides. You have a 20 minute uh, slot and 18 slides is plenty. Um, so some guidelines, make sure to use graphics and photo, don't just use text slides. Um, no more than 100 words per slide in print that's large and easy to read. You're going to be presenting this online, so you need for people to be able to read uh, your texts. Uh, the slide check should include the following. This is sort of a rough outline of what you would need, and you might have to adjust the number of slides depending on the number of topics, etc. So there'd be a cover slide with the name of the team members and the title of your report, 
a brief introduction, which recapitulates the, the introduction and explanation that you had in your scientific, uh, in your extended abstract. And then an outline of the topic. What topics are going to be presented? Who is going to be presenting them? And this would be a brief slide. So, I, and the way that most teams have done this, there's been one person who stands up and does this introduction and explains the names and uh, the outline, etc. And then there are a series of people who present uh, topics within the overall thing. Um, so there'll be a topic and no more than three slides per topic. Um, and in this case, I've envisioned that there are uh, three different topics that three different people are covering. And finally, there'll be recommendations. What do you think is a solution to this problem? How should we work on it? What further scientific investigations are needed? How could regulation or societal actions help to mitigate this problem? And finally, there'll be summary and conclusions, just summarizing everything, and a bibliography. Um, I don't know why it says intro down here. So that's generally an outline of what I'm expecting for Milestone 3. Now, uh, Carrie O'Reilly and I will be posting a sign-up sheet for um, when we can get together with um, the teams and talk about their rough draft. I'm going to schedule these uh, sessions for Saturday um, and for evening. Uh, so that should allow uh, you know, everybody to participate and despite whatever other classes that you might have. So we'll, we'll be putting out a sign-up sheet and then we'll be allowing about 45 minutes uh, per consultation. And uh, you can expect that Carrie and I will go through in detail and make recommendations and do our very best to help you make an excellent presentation and to get the um, extended abstract and the slides in tip-top shape and to be ready for your presentation um, further on. At that same time, during those consultations, we will be uh, figuring out the schedule of presentations. So remember, there's going to be there are 15 teams. We have five days over which we're going to be reporting, um, and each uh, so different teams will be signing up for different slots. And so there's going to be some sign up things here. Carrie's going to be working with me to make a sign up sheet, uh, probably as a discussion um, uh, uh, page in a Canvas, so that all the teams can sign up for. Um, the consultation on milestone three, and then for your eventual presentation slot. Okay, so that's the material I have on uh, team project milestone three, which is due on um, the 3rd of April coming right up. Are there any questions on this topic? Please go ahead and press your space bar and speak. Somebody must have How at least one. Is the extended abstract supposed to be? Uh, 750 to 1,000 words. Does and, that include like the bulleted list of um, like scientific facts and stuff? Um, I don't know. Uh, yes, I, I think it does. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I, it's hard to give you an exact answer, but I'm looking for an abstract, not a long report. And, um, you know, I think a thousand words is probably long enough to do that. If you need slightly more, it doesn't include the bibliography. The bibliography is separate from the extended abstract. And also, is it okay if our group has more than like three subtopics within our um, overarching thing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just be, be aware that, you know, it's very hard to have a slide and present that in less than a minute. And you have a 20 minute uh, slot. So uh, you're going to want to be, um, uh, you know, being very economical. So if you have more than uh, three topics, then you might want to have only two slides for one of those topics to, to make extra space. Clear? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Other questions? Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by um, the scientific basis that you're reporting on? Okay, in the example of climate change, your scientific basis would be to discuss, um, you know, what's the concept of invasive species? You know, how long has this problem occurred? How widespread is it? Um, and, uh, you, know, what, you know, what are the sort of ecological uh, principles that make invasive species 
successful when they invade a new territory and what you know some of the consequences of invasive species are and also how you know the circumstances for invasive species have changed recently uh, due to you know um, a more uh, you know globalization of, of uh, uh, transport and, and shipping, uh, you know expanded pet ownership, um, uh, changes in, in climate that allow species to expand, extend their range, and so forth. So those would be the sort of scientific uh, findings. Um, okay, thank you. Is that clear? Okay, and then your conclusions and recommendations. And so at the end of this, you're, you're gonna, you don't need a lot of, of um, uh, verbiage on this, but you wanna say, you know, this is important to society because. So in the case of, you know, invasive species, it's important to society, because, you know, because if you think of it like the Burmese python, that they are really damaging, you know, critical ecosystems, uh, such as the, the um, Everglades, uh, really being damaged by these invasive species, and that has economic consequences, that has ecological consequences, et cetera. Um, so that's the societal interest. Now, in your uh, conclusions and recommendations, you might want to say things like, you know, we recommend uh, more regulation on uh, exotic pets to prevent um, release of that, and that, you know, there should be a, uh, a, a uh, hotline or, or a monitoring to uh, report when, you know, new species that might be potentially invasive appear. Um, so that kind of recommendation, uh, you know, in conclusions. So um, do you want to, you know, try to summarize and synthesize everything, all of the different facts and, and trends that you've reported on, and then, uh, you know, put them together in some conclusions and then make some positive re recommendations uh, about how the problem for society might be mitigated through better science, better regulation, so forth. Does it seem clear to everybody? Can't see you nodding your heads, but I'm gonna assume that. Yes. Okay, okay. All right, um, so are there other questions about sort of uh, general topics? I, I do wanna get on with our, our lecture, um, but um, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and answer any questions if anybody has anything uh, pending. Okay, great. Well, let me go ahead and share my PowerPoint screen. So I think I'm getting better at this. Let's see. All right. Um, so we talked about nutrients from the sea, and we said we were going to discuss the ways in which, you know, human society has acquired nutrients, food, but not just food, um, also a fertilizer and other products um, from uh, wild living organisms in the sea, uh, largely fish, but also corals and, and uh, invertebrates uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, we started out with the example of the um, uh, Peruvian sardine, Peruvian anchovy, uh, and said that these were a very abundant species. Uh, we described the way in which um, uh, the, the Peruvian anchovy, uh, Peruvian uh, supports uh, these large bird colonies and that the, the uh, bird colonies were initially a source of fertilizer during the end of the uh, 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries. And so, um, um, you know, that was sort of the ecological basis. We also discussed the way in which upwelling and natural climate cycles uh, have an impact on uh, populations of uh, anchovy and cause them to uh, boom and bust at different times and describe an ecosystem which is basically at equilibrium uh, with this process. But, um, uh, you know, uh, when we start introducing fishing and human interaction, this natural balance which the uh, ecosystem has obtained over, you know, uh, a millennia of uh, adaptation uh, changes radically. And that's what we want to look next at. So we have this natural system. Um, this natural system was exploited historically for fertilizer. Um, and then more recently, starting in the early 1970s, um, anchovy became an important uh, fishery product. And so uh, there were a number of um, steps that produced, uh, led to the explosion of uh, anchovy and as a as a uh, fishery species, species subject to, to fishing. Uh, 
And one of the major technological advances was the development of mechanized uh, net hauling um, capabilities. So this is a net hauling winch or block. Uh, it was invented by a Portuguese uh, American fisherman uh, back in the 1920s. And it really revolutionized the way in which uh, this kind of net could be deployed from ships. This kind of net is a very old uh, design of net. It's been used uh, for you know, centuries, um, but previously it had to be hauled by human uh, uh, power, muscle power. And so that uh, put limits on how much, um, how large the nets could be and how much fish they could catch. With the development of this um, uh, puretic uh, uh, net hauling winch, it became possible to deploy, to deploy very large nets. This is the way these uh, nets work. Um, uh, typically, I would draw on the whiteboard uh, to show you this, but what happens is that this, they deploy a net in a circle and the floats on the top of the net keep the top of the net above the water, at the top of the water. The bottom of the net, there's a chain that weights it down and um, keeps the net hanging like a wall in the water and these, these nets are typically you know three to five meters uh, tall so you can think of a, a large circular uh, con, you know compartment or, or trap of net uh, with floats on the top and um, chain weights hanging down and so what the way they do, the, they do this fishing is that the, the mothership deploys a little uh, small boat and the small boat pulls the net around and brings it back to the mothership. And when it comes back to the ship, they haul in on a line which is attached to the bottom of the net, the, the, um, the chain weights. And that draws the bottom of the net together like a purse. And so this uh, kind of net in, in this kind of fishing is called purse seining. And here we see a purse seine which has been uh, pursed at the bottom and it's being hauled in uh, by that uh, uh, mechanized uh, winch hauler, and you can see the vast quantity of fish that this kind of uh, fishing can produce. You know, literally many tons of fish being caught at once. And this uh, points to a number of uh, features of the Peruvian anchovy fishery uh, that it was extremely productive of biomass. So you can load uh, in a in a day's operation catch you know. Uh, 10, 100, uh, 10 tons of, of, of anchovy and load them on board the ship. And so um, when it was discovered in the 1970s that um, these, this kind of fishing was, uh, could be attained, uh, anchovy gradually became a very important uh, uh, form of catch. It's supported by, uh, you know, and it was recommended by the United Nations and by the Peruvian government, but the Chilean government also got in on that. And they uh, really expanded fishing operations in order to catch these fish. Now these fish, as I showed you before, are rather small. You know, they're no more than a couple inches long. Um, they can be eaten. This is, this is uh, the way that you make uh, anchovy into sardines is you put them in a can. Uh, so uh, sardines are, are the product that comes in a can. So you can certainly can and eat these anchovy, but the main product that um, was produced with the Peruvian anchovy fishery was fish meal. So they take those uh, individual anchovy, they dry them and they grind them, uh, treat them in other ways, and this makes fish meal. So in the early 60s uh, and the late 70s, uh, anchovy expanded very rapidly, and this fish meal was a, a valuable product. Now the fish meal was used uh, largely as animal feed, uh, um, and uh, but it became you know very important. Uh, you know the uh, dairy farmers in the United States uh, used um, uh, fish meal as a, uh, a source of feed for their cattle. And so all the experts uh, predicted that uh, they could just keep growing the fleet and catching more and more uh, anchovy because. Um, you know, as many as they caught, they didn't seem to exhaust the, the catch. So they weren't getting any decline in their landings, uh, no matter how much they seemed to increase the, the, the harvest. However, that was in uh, normal circumstances. And then in 1970, there was a particularly severe El Nino. And we've already described what an El Nino is. This is an oceanographic and climatic uh, event that occurs episodically every couple of years. And we know by now that El Ninos have 
great effects on uh, weather in the uh, Western Hemisphere. So our weather in Florida, um, the occurrence of hurricanes, the average temperature, the amount of rainfall we get is affected by uh, El Nino events. And we all know that, we've seen that reported. Um, but in the 1970s, early 1970s, we really didn't have such a clear picture about El Nino, you know, the way that it occurred, why it occurred, and what certainly what impacts it might have on uh, oceanic circulation, and in particular in upwelling uh, off the coast of Peru and Chile, or the west coast, the west coast of, of South America. Um, but, uh, and so as a consequence, when the El Nino came along, you recall when I described El Nino conditions, the um, current stopped and the uh, north going uh, wind stopped and so there was no more uh, water being uh, uh, de deflected to the left um, in the uh, southern hemisphere and so with the cessation of, of upwelling the uh, population of anchovy you know, population of and the, the primary production the popula and the populations of zooplankton, which are the food for anchovies, they crash, and then the anchovies crash, and then the bird populations crash. So that's a, a, a normal appearance, uh, occurrence to which this population was adapted. So under normal circumstances, the, the fish would retreat a little bit further in uh, towards shore, and there would be far fewer of them, some birds would follow, um, but there'd be, you know, so there'd be massive die-off, but there would be a core group of, of birds and fish that would survive. Um, and so that's what would normally occur. When the uh, anchovy fishery crashed, however, the uh, fishing boats didn't die off. Um, they didn't stop fishing. They, they had economic um, uh, obligations that they had to meet. They had to pay their mortgages and pay their crew. And so the, um, the fishing boats, instead of operating offshore, began to chase the fish, the remaining surviving fish, all the way to the coast. And so they accelerated the decline in the abundance of the anchovy population by continuing to fish, despite the fact that the normal conditions that produce the uh, landings of the fish had changed and the population had fundamentally crashed. And so this was, a, um, you know, this exacerbated, made much worse the impacts of the, um, uh, the El Nino year. So it took uh, some years for the fishery uh, population to, um, to recover. So here's a, a graph starting in 1950 showing the run up of, of anchovy in millions of tons. So uh, starting by, you know, by um, 1970, they were landing you know, close to 14 million tons of anchovy per year. And then along came the El Nino year of 1973, and this crashed completely. There was some slight recovery, but well, then it went down to virtually nothing uh, because of the fact that, you know, instead of having, even after the El Nino had uh, passed, the population had been reduced to such a small level that it took a very long time, in fact, um, you know, almost uh, two decades uh, before the production uh, could increase again. And, and then again, it started running up in 1995, they increased landings, and then there was another El Nino year and there was another population crash. And so this uh, boom and bust cycle uh, had continued all the way through the, you know, the late uh, 19th or 20th century, I guess, um, and still is a is a uh, factor, um, you know. Uh, and so uh, this is an example of a mismanaged fishery. And what we want to do now is to consider how fishing should be managed and what the what the basic science and principles here that are work are at work. And um, just a little bit more sort of sightseeing. This is a, a population of the bird that eats the the um, anchovy. This is a guanai. Cormorant. So this is a cormorant, just like the cormorants that you see around here. Um, but these uh, birds have the, the uh, uh, feature of living in these very, very dense colonies, and these colonies are what produce the, um, produce the uh, large amounts of guano that was the basis of fertilizer. This uh, picture was taken on a nature reserve off the coast of um, uh, Chile. 
and the birds are here. This is actually a, a pretty small colony as colonies go, um, but it's you know a number of birds. And this colony, as I'll show you in the next slide or two, um, was suffering from a, the impacts of an El Nino year. This is in 2015, uh, 2016, and I visited uh, this site. And you can see some other birds. Um, this is a you know a really amazing uh, site. There are uh, penguins, rockhopper penguins that climb along these rocks, and many other bird species. So this this island, which nobody is allowed to go onto, or people are allowed on this island, um, you know, is a very rich bird sanctuary. Um, and this uh, shows you know another uh, colony of the of the Gurai cormorants, but you can see that there are very very few uh, birds at this site. And you can see, if you look closely, the reason why. The reason why is in this El Nino year, exceptionally for this part of the world, we were getting um, rainfall. And typically it does not rain. This is a very, very arid part of the world. And so that lack of rain is what allows the huge amounts of guano to accumulate uh, where the colonies exist. And, but you can see that you know, the, the rain has been dissolving the, the, um, the guano and eroding the, the nesting places where the birds uh, would live. And it's also, these impacts are also driving down the availability of nutrients for plankton production. And um, so this is an example of the low end, the El Nino impact on the bird communities. Okay, so we want to think about global fishing and, you know, and with that example, try to explore more uh, what the phenomenon of fishing is. And so here's a map, this is a very coarse, and what this shows are, you know, sort of the, uh, a couple of things. We see the most productive regions, the high phytoplankton production areas in the ocean. And you can see that, um, uh, that the coastal uh, regions, the, the regions on the coasts of continents are typically uh, quite productive in terms of uh, of, of plankton production and plankton are the base, the phytoplankton are the basis of the food chain. So where there are lots of plentiful phytoplankton, there tends to be plentiful um, uh, uh, fish and, and other uh, marine organisms that are, that are higher in the food chain. So um, this, uh, you know, what we know about oceanography can inform some of this. You know, we see this highly productive area on the west coasts of uh, these continents, and this is a feature of the um, uh, winds that blow on these continents and produce upwelling. So we've already talked about the upwelling off the west coast of, of Peru and, and Chile, and so no surprise, this is a very productive region. There are similarly productive regions off the west coast of Africa. So the entire west coast of Africa is an upwelling zone, and there's lots of production there. Um, there east, here's, you can see, interestingly, so this um, is upwelling uh, in the equatorial Pacific. And the upwelling here is caused by winds blowing along the coast, that upwelling process that we described. And then the, the upwelling along the equatorial region of the um, Pacific is caused by this process of upwelling that uh, is created when winds blow across the equator. And so that um, blowing across the equator uh, creates divergence because uh, Coriolis goes to zero at the equator. And so there's, um, um, you know, wind is being moved towards the, um, the uh, away from the, um, the equator on either side, uh, and so that creates uh, a divergence, and that divergence is what produces this upwelling. So that's one uh, component of this map. The other component of this map are these brown lines, and what these brown lines are indicating are the exclusive economic zones of the respective countries that are there. Now, the law of the sea, the 1973 law of the sea, um, which was passed, um, you know, and signed by many, many, many countries in the world, not the United States. Um, the law of sea uh, uh, defines a 200 mile exclusive economic zone, so EEZ. And so what this exclusive EEZ does is it gives the respective countries control over the economic activities in their coastal waters out to 200 nautical miles. And there are a lot of different sort of um, agreements and protocols that define 
you know, where you draw the boundary between the EEZ of two countries that uh, share a coastline and have a boundary along that coast. You know, typically you extend in a straight line uh, the boundary from the coast, but, you know, that's not always possible because sometimes the boundary is, uh, you know, is at an angle. Um, so that, you know, there are a lot of treaties and, and regulations that define how this EEZ is defined. And of course, islands become very important because they, you know, although the island can be very small in area, they um, control a large economic zone. And so, for example, here, this is the, um, uh, the island of Rapa Nui, uh, most commonly called Easter Island, and Easter Island is part of uh, Chile. And so Chile gets to extend its exclusive economic zone to 200 miles around this uh, remote little speck of land uh, in, the, in the South Pacific. So islands can become, and ownership of islands can become contentious uh, because um, ownership of an island gives a country uh, you know, a larger piece of real estate that can be included in their e exclusive economic zone. Um, and you know, the, uh, this map here, this is kind of out of date, but this shows the um, uh, catch uh, in metric tons of all fish. And so that's uh, 2,700,000 metric tons of, uh, of fish were landed in 2002 in all of the uh, exclusive economic zones. And um, some of the countries which uh, have uh, large fishing fleets, and so you know, fishing, of course, can be conducted in two ways or a number of different ways. Uh, there are coastal fisheries, and these are fishing uh, boats that are fishing vessels that typically stay close to land. And then there are high seas fishing boats that you know, both fish um, uh, in international waters around the world, or by agreement can sometimes fish in the, within the national waters, the EEZ of other countries. So there are a few fishing nations that drive a lot of this, um, uh, Russia, um, uh, Spain, uh, China, uh, Korea, Japan, um, uh, Spain, uh, France, they, uh, North America to some extent. Um, these are all countries that have large uh, uh, international fishing fleets that where the, the fishing vessels go around the world literally. Now there's some features about marine fisheries that make it uh, uh, different from uh, many other kinds of activities and many other sort of capitalized um, uh, uh, investments and, and productions. There's no, nobody owns the fish in the sea. You know, the exclusive economic zone imparts some ownership or some degree of control to the national country um, with, that holds the EEZ. Uh, however, within that zone or outside that zone, nobody owns any international individual fish. You know, there isn't a brand on it. Uh, it doesn't belong to anyone until it's caught. Um, and so, uh, this is unlike, you know, most other sorts of, uh, you know, renewable resource capital production uh, uh, procedures. So, for example, uh, harvesting trees, typically, the, you know, almost always, the tree is owned by the landowner. And so uh, the landowner can, can control when the tree is cut and, and the, the plan for renewable, uh, sustainable logging or unsustainable logging, there's an ownership there. Likewise, there's ownership on, you know, hunting and there's ownership on other sorts of renewable resources. But uh, the fact that no one owns individual fish, you know, poses real challenges for how society should manage this, um, this activity. There's about 100 million tons per year uh, caught in the, in the fishery, and you know, that sounds like a big number, but that's actually a fairly small portion of the total food that's consumed by Earth's population of you know, 7 billion uh, people or so. Uh, increasingly, uh, aquaculture, uh, both aquaculture on, you know, in, in ponds and in some forms of cage culture that we'll talk to, contributes about a third of this. Um, and 90% uh, of this fish landing comes from the continental, continental shells, and it's dominated by a few major fishing nations. And then as we've already illustrated with the Pacific uh, sardine, the uh, Atlantic herring, and the Peruvian anchovy, um, fisheries uh, tend to crash when they are overexploited or overfished. And um, so, uh, unfortunately, there have been many, many 
uh, fishing populations, which have been historically uh, quite productive, which have over the past uh, several decades really been begun to crash and no longer produce uh, the, the, anything like the levels before. Many of them are completely closed. An example uh, is the Atlantic cod. Cod was a very, very important uh, fishery species during the um, you know, time of colonialism. That's one of the, a lot of the people that came to the uh, North America from Europe were uh, fishers who came over, uh, particularly the French did a lot of fishing and the English did a lot of fishing uh, off the coast of Newfoundland up in here. And so Atlantic cod was uh, again a fish population that produced huge quantities of, of landings. Uh, well, the, the, the Atlantic cod has been overfished and the Atlantic cod fishery off the coast of North America has been closed for uh, almost a decade now. You can still buy Atlantic cod. Uh, that, you know, Iceland uh, has got a sustainable Atlantic cod fishery and England, I think, also uh, lands cod uh, from some places. But um, the landings of cod and the incident of cod as a part of a diet has really, really, really decreased. Um, because the, the, the population no longer sustains large amounts of fishing. So we have to ask, what are the consequences of fishing? And how, um, you know, how does the way that fishing is regulated or executed, you know, how does that impact the ecosystem? And so we're going to go back to something that we've talked about before. Um, this is the logistic curve. And we've, I've already introduced the logistic curve in some previous lectures. And we're now going to see how this um, mathematical theory or ecological theory applies to a problem like managing fisheries. And uh, remember that this is calculated from the logistic growth equation. And the idea is that small populations in uh, areas of abundant resources can grow exponentially, uh, that eventually competition slows the growth rate and um, um, you know, that the population will stabilize at some uh, carrying capacity, their logistic carrying capacity. And at carrying capacity, the growth rate in theory is zero. So the population is expanded to utilize all available resources. The availability of these resources may vary from year to year with changes in climate or weather or you know, other sorts of features, um, but uh, typically they're, it's at a low level. And so this is the um, logistic curve, uh, and this is the logistic curve in particular applied to um, the, the problem of uh, managing fisheries. Okay, so the idea of the logistic curve is that there's a carrying capacity um, you know, population size, and here that's, this, these are made up numbers, but we're saying that this population size of 100, whether it's, you know, 100 million individuals or whatever the units are, this is the carrying capacity for a um, theoretical uh, fishery, okay? And so um, if we think about how this population uh, grew to reach this carrying capacity, we recall that in the beginning, and, you know, there's an exponential rate. Now the exponential rate would follow a course like this, would go up without limit. Um, but you know, as the population begins to increase, there's environmental pressure, competition, predation, other factors that sort of flatten this curve and cause the curve to arise at a slower rate. Uh, and eventually the uh, uh, environmental uh, limits, predation and other limits on the population would cause it to stabilize around the, um, the carrying capacity. Well, the theory, um, and this is the theory that uh, on which a lot of the fishery management decisions uh, in the later part of the 20th century were made, um, this, um, the theory is that the maximum growth rate for a population occurs somewhere in this middle limb of the uh, logistic curve. So if you took the carrying capacity and reduced the size of the population to some lower size, then the environmental limits, the lack of nutri nutrients, the predation pressure, et cetera, would be uh, reduced and the population would grow at a more rapid rate, okay? So the theory is that if, if you reduce an additional population to a lower level, um, and, you know, you can extract the amount of growth year on, year out um, as a sustainable yield, okay? So, uh, and so this uh, population size, and here theoretically it's at 50% 
uh, of the uh, carrying capacity. At 50% of carrying capacity, there would be a theoretical maximum sustainable yield um, from this population size. Okay, so this is the uh, calculated as the number of individuals ab added per harvest to a population that exactly is exactly one half of its carrying capacity. And so that number of individuals added per harvest period to the population is what in theory a, a managed fishery could extract from this population in a sustainable basis. Um, now, of course, that there are many, many things that are not taken into account by the theoretical maximum sustainable yield, and that's, um, that poses a problem. So there are other ways of calculating what the, um, what the yield should be. So for example, if you, you know, have your maximum sustainable yield here, and then all of a sudden there's some episodic event that causes conditions to crash, um, you know, well, you might be extracting too many fish for that level. Um, so another um, uh, yield is the optimum sustainable population. And this is the maximum population that's indefinitely su sustainable. Okay, so this is represented here in this sort of odd curve here. And so this is the, on this axis is population size. And on this axis is the surplus of recruitment, the surplus of individuals over the period of um, catch. And so, you know, when the population size is zero, there are zero surplus individuals. When the population has been reduced to half, the um, uh, uh, maximum number of, of individual, sustainable individuals is arrived at. <coughs> at the original level or carrying capacity, no new individuals are being added to the population. Um, so there's no um, infinitely sustainable yield for a population of that size. So what does this imply? This implies that if um, a, a fishing operation, if fishers are going to start exploiting an unexploited population, initially they're going to get high catches as they reduce the population down toward this maximum sustainable size. So the in initial rate of catch is going to be quite high or probably higher than it would be when it reaches the maximum sustainable uh, size, the theoretical maximum. And, you know, uh, so um, this poses a, an incredible challenge and really a challenge which has been very, very rarely met in practice for how we should organize and manage fishing operations. Uh, and so here are some of the problems with the maximum sustainable yield population. So the population must have one exact carrying capacity, which is predictable from this logistic curve. And you know the, the theoretical numbers are very nice, but of course populations are going to be different. There are going to be different resources that are limiting. Um, there are different uh, sort of environmental pressures of, of predation and, and climate, etc. And so it's very difficult to know what that exact um, uh, carrying capacity is. And um, the managers have to also have perfect knowledge of the carrying capacity and population size, and there have to be near perfect cooperation among all the forces acting to harvest the population. And in the case of, um, you know, uh, the Peruvian anchovy, for example, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the forces acting to harvest the population include not just the fishermen or the fishers who are collecting the fish with their boats, it also includes our friend the Gournai uh, cormorants. And one of the problems uh, that they encountered when they tried to respond to the and tried to plan uh, what the recovery of the anchovy fishery would be after the initial crash was they forgot to include the birds. And so when the population recovered, they said, oh, okay, well, we can go back to fishing at such and such a level. And they left out the, uh, you know, the amount of yield that would be eaten by birds as the bird population grew. Um, so, um, you know, these are very uh, uh, stringent limits on a knowledge and understanding that have to be in place in order for the, um, uh, you know, a management of sustainable yield to be attained. So, um, you know, well, this is, uh, maybe I got this a little bit out of order, but this is the J curve and the S curve, we've already seen it before, and this is the carrying capacity. Okay, so 
um, you know, here's the sort of theoretical uh, response. And so if everything is perfect and all the things, everybody has perfect knowledge of carrying capacity and there's perfect cooperation among all of the uh, forces acting to harvest, you get down to a sustainable yield and that sustainable yield uh, can be estimated correctly. And then they can be, that yield can be taken from the population, uh, you know, over extended periods of time. Okay. What happens if there were mistakes? Suppose, for example, they overestimated, managers overestimated the size of the population. Well, if they overestimated the size of the population, then they would be overestimating the amount of yield that could be taken on an annual basis. And so instead of allowing the population to recover, you know, along this portion of the curve, it would drive the population down. And that's exactly what happened with the Peruvian anchovy uh, when they forgot to account for the big impacts of El Nino years and for other competing factors such as um, bird populations. So in practice, it's almost impossible to hit this uh, population correctly. And there's another problem in this, which is almost as you know, equally or if not more uh, difficult to manage, which is that you have individual fishers who are acting in their self-interest driving this. You know, even that's the case, even if you have a state-regulated fishery, uh, such as they had during the former Soviet Union, or uh, the uh, Chinese um, uh, government now has nationally managed uh, fisheries. Um, you know, they're all uh, acting in their self-interest. And so, um, you know, if when they start landing, the initial landings are quite high. Uh, but when, uh, because they're reducing the population, so they're not only extracting the annual yield, they're extracting this excess population size, okay? But when you get down to the maximum sustainable yield size, the population, uh, the yield is gonna be less than it is here. And um, so that poses a major problem. So, you know, this is a sort of a, uh, population, um, you know, uh, sort of the global picture of how populations uh, are overfished. And, you know, this is the um, uh, maximum sustainable yield and the total catch. And so typically the total catch goes up and then it keeps, they keep fishing and the, um, the total biomass goes down and the um, size, the L max, this is the average maximum length of individuals decreases and the numbers of collapsed uh, fisheries um, uh, have increased. So this is the sort of global picture of how fishing has uh, driven many, many fished populations or exploited populations uh, towards uh, collapse or very low numbers. So <clears throat> the problem then is overfishing. That is to say, we're taking more than a yield which could be sustained uh, over uh, long periods of time. So how would you know if a fish population was being overfished? Well, first of all, there would be a decline in the catch. Okay, and here we have to note that the catch has to be adjusted for effort. And so if somebody goes out with uh, you know, a, a boat with uh, several fishers go out with hooks and lines and they're gonna catch tuna, um, you know, they could spend you know, uh, all day offshore or several days offshore fishing uh, for tuna and they would catch you know, some number of tuna, 50, 100, whatever the number is. Um, and, but their level of effort would have been four days at sea. That would be very different for our commercial uh, fishing than when it was going out with a long line fishery and catching hundreds of, of, of fish. So um, there has to be an adjustment and the um, adjustment is catch per unit of effort. Um, so that tries to normalize the catch uh, to the effort. And so when there's a decline in the catch per unit of effort, the, um, that's an indication that the population size has been uh, decreased. There's also a reduction in the average size of the individuals that are being caught. And so uh, there's a sharp decline uh, um, you know, of individuals. The individuals being landed get smaller and smaller. And this is unfortunate both in terms of uh, smaller fish are less valuable, um, but ecologically and in terms of population, the smaller fish tend to be less 
uh, reproductively successful. So in most fi uh, uh, fisheries populations, it's the large female individuals in the, in the population that produce the overwhelming uh, majority of eggs, uh, larvae, and uh, young fish to replenish the population. So if those large individuals are removed, uh, this can have a um, uh, exacerbated effect or an extra effect on reducing the recovery ability of the, the recover the, the population to recover from fishing. Um, we would expect to see sharp declines of seasonal fishing, and in practice, overfishing is is very difficult to de detect. So usually, when you start seeing these indicators, already the population has been reduced. And so this is a you know one of the things that makes it very challenging. Uh, to manage fisheries uh, according to these uh, theoretical constraints. We want to look at a different problem uh, in fisheries, and this is a problem of what are called shrinking baselines. <clears throat> and uh, so this is the idea that uh, we have a fishing population and people are catching fish and they're happy, uh, they think they're doing well, but they don't, they tend not to realize, you know, that the conditions have gotten a lot worse. And this is something that we can track, uh, and there's a, there's a, a you know a, a um, uh, rigorous scientific basis for using uh, information about recreational fishing for understanding the impacts that fishing has had on fish populations generally. And so here's a, a picture taken from Key West uh, in 1958, and it shows um, the uh, uh, recreational fishing boat uh, head Greyhound Two. Uh, fishing out of Key West, Florida, and they've been out for one day, and um, this is what they've caught. Uh, and you see here the species, there's a Goliath grouper, there's snowy grouper, uh, a lot of great big groupers uh, essentially have been caught. And, um, you know, this was one day's harvest. So um, this population in 1958, uh, the, the ecosystem supported the, um, the population of very large individuals. And these individuals, um, the largest individuals are typically female, and they produce uh, trillions of eggs and larvae. And so uh, removing these uh, large individuals uh, reduces the, reproductive, the overall reproductive uh, capacity of their populations. Well, let's step forward to the 1980s. Well, here we are. Um, this is the Gulf Stream 3, and uh, this is another fishing boat operating out of um, uh, Key West, Florida. And these guys have been out fishing for a day. And you can see that there's a very different sort of catch that they produce. Everybody's happy. They've been offshore. They've had a nice time. You've drunk a few beers. And now they're coming back into port. And what have they got? They've got red snapper, vermilion snapper, lane snapper. Oh, here's one grouper, snowy grouper here. Um, there's a cavalier and, and you know a, a jack, um, you know some kind of a, a another jack here. So these are all species of fish that you know back in 1958 they might not have even bothered catching. They probably wouldn't have brought in the, the jacks because they're you know not, weren't considered very good eating in those days. Um, but everybody's happy. You know they've caught lots of fish. Well, let's take another step forward. Here's the greyhound five. And again, you know, so that was the uh, the descendant of the Greyhound 2 that we looked at in, um, in 1958. Well, here we are in, in 2007, nearly 50 years later, and this is what they've landed after a, uh, a day of fishing. Um, and we don't know how many people are on the boat. Um, so, you know, probably more people on the boat in 2007 than in, 2000, in 1958. So the catch has to be normalized to the level of effort. Now, we don't know what that is, but we can assume that there are more fishermen being taken offshore in 2007 than there were in 1958. So this is the, the catch per unit of effort has to be divided among all of these different, uh, all the different fishermen who produce this catch. And what do we see here? Well, no grouper at all. So that population has been completely removed. Uh, there are red snapper, vermilion snapper. They're a lot smaller in size. And the, the catch now includes uh, species such as uh, dogfish or shark, which would not previously have been, they would have been considered trash fish and they wouldn't even bother to bring them in, probably would have just cut them loose on the line and uh, not even landed them uh, back in 1958. So um, the idea here is that the baseline, the productivity of the population uh, has been reduced 
very significantly by fishing, but that it's happened so gradually that you know nobody would say, oh, well, the, the population has completely changed. But if we're able to look at this scientifically and quantitatively, over that period of 50 years or so, there has been a radical uh, change in the fish population and a, a major, um, and that change you know, has been uh, almost certainly negative. There are fewer fish, the, the ecosystem is less productive, uh, less healthy, more subject to um, uh, uh, variation and impacts. So um, that's something, another problem in managing fisheries correctly is this idea of shifting baselines. Well, we can understand, um, you know, how fishing has responded if we look at some numbers of fishing vessels. And uh, here you see an interesting uh, feature here. And so this goes from 1970 to 2004, so just about 35 years. And uh, this is a five year increment. So this is the number, uh, global number of decked fishing vessels. And so these are you know, not open boats, but these are uh, fishing boats that would be capable of going offshore. They have deck. Uh, and so this is considered you know, a higher level of, um, these are probably mostly commercial fishing. But what do we see in these numbers? Well, we see in, initially in these numbers that they are increasing pretty rapidly. Um, you know, so there's a you know nearly a doubling over over 20 years here. But then uh, in 1995, the population sort of um, levels off and doesn't really increase. So there's very little change between um, you know in this uh, 10 year, 15 year period compared to this 15 year period. And so in a way. The, uh, the population of decked fishing vessels globally has increased uh, rapidly, just like a fish population would do in an unexploited territory. And then it's stabilized uh, and um, you know, has sort of reached a carrying capacity. Well, it's even worse than a carrying capacity. And this is the trend and global overcapacity of fishing efforts. So there are no more boats out there than the population of, uh, of fish can support. And you can see this if you go around the Gulf Coast. So this is taken on the coast of uh, Louisiana somewhere. I think I took this picture. And these are all uh, shrimp boats that are tied up. And they'll, they'll be shrimping seasons, but the seasons will be pretty short compared to what they used to be. And these fishing boats will go offshore uh, during a very limited season and return uh, with fish. And so. Um, you know, this is an indication that there are far fewer shrimp available to be caught uh, than there used to be. And you see these idle boats uh, all over the place. And so, um, you know, even the population of decked uh, fishing vessels, as we saw in that previous slide, uh, is, isn't a complete indication of the level of the global fishing effort, which has been reduced because the populations of fish are not there. All right, well, let's turn from, um, uh, you know, these sort of commercial operations to what we could call artisanal fishing. And I'm looking here at Africa. Now, the African continent uh, has a real uh, problem, many countries have a real problem with protein supply. Um, there is not enough protein uh, to support the human, well, it's difficult for the human populations in these countries to um, attain enough Populate enough protein to meet the normal needs of, uh, of um, human growth and nutrition. And there are a number of consequences for that. One thing that happens a lot in Africa is people eat with so called bush meat. And this is uh, wild caught antelope and monkeys and other things that are eaten. Um, fishing is an important source of protein in Africa. And you know, a lot of the population centers in Africa tend to be on the West Coast. And one factor driving this uh, population growth is the availability of fishing. So fishing is an important uh, component of supplying uh, fishing. And most of the fishing in um, uh, Africa, conducted by Africans, is done what's called an artisanal fishing. And so these are, are not, this is a series of, of uh, fishing bureaus. Uh, and this is on the coast of Senegal. And these are these long ship uh, boats. They're probably about uh, almost, some of them are almost uh, 28, 30 feet long. Um, they're very, very seaworthy. Uh, they have this deep bow here. They can uh, tolerate pretty rough seas. Um, they're made out of wood. Uh, they typically uh, drag them up on the shore when they're not using them. So they pull them above the high tide and then they launch them. 
Um, these uh, ships are, are the, the, the design of these boats is such that um, they can be moved up the shore uh, sort of by walking them up the shore. Um, you know, one person gets on one end and that lifts the end up and then they push the other end up and then the person goes down and lifts the other end. So you can, you know, without having powerful machinery, you can drag these very, very heavy boats uh, up the shore and get them above the high tide. And you can see some of the uh, fishing nets that they're using. They, so they go out with uh, seines, like the seines that we've seen. Um, they also use a hook and line. And these are very important fishing. Okay. Well, um, all the west coast of Africa has exclusive economic zones. So in theory, the countries of West Africa should control uh, who gets to catch fish in their waters. Unfortunately, in many cases, there are um, you know, corrupt managers who uh, allow um, factory trawlers to come in and harvest fish in the same waters where these artisanal fishermen would be operating. And so uh, what happens is that these small boat operations are competing with these huge factory trawlers. And um, the, the competition is very, very unfair. And so as a consequence, um, the protein, which would be important for the human population of West Africa, gets diverted by fishing nations like Russia, uh, Spain, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, China. And so um, as a consequence, many of the um, uh, fishing, uh, these artisanal fishing, stop fishing because it's not uh, lucrative anymore, not, uh, not sustainable economically, and they become what we call pirates. And so uh, these pirates have done things like hijacked oil tankers and hijacked other ships and so forth. And everybody sort of you know, says, oh, how terrible these people are pirates and they're you know, attacking legitimate trade. Well, um, you know, it's also fair to ask in this kind of a picture with a corrupt system of government and um, you know, uh, a callous um, uh, fishing managers, who really is the pirate in this, in this sort of um, case here? And I think a case can be made both ways. So yes, there are um, illegal uh, piracy operations and they're very unfortunate, uh, but they don't uh, occur in a vacuum. There, there are um, you know, economic pressures that force that. Um, so, and here's an example of you know, just how that works here. So you know, these are all the countries that are going around to exploit uh, these fisheries. So um, France, Spain, Portugal, um, you know, uh, Russia, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, they, they all send uh, uh, international fishing boats, you know, factory boats, to fish all around Africa. And that uh, products are then you know, imported back into the, uh, the, the uh, uh, offshore fishing operations. And so a few countries harvest the food from this, this area. And so that creates uh, problems. Um, and so uh, one of the problems is the income, um, you know, what happens when uh, seines are removed and fishing restrictions are put on. So when there's no restriction, you tend to get low levels of uh, fish income. When there are restrictions in closed areas, um, the restrictions can work to the benefit of local fishers. Well, um, I talked about this issue of um, uh, fish populations uh, and um, you know how the, the unexploited population responds to fishing and what happens. I want to give another example of a fish population that's crashed, and this uh, is the fish called orange ruffy. Uh, orange ruffy, there's a big picture of them here. These are large, deep-bodied fish. Uh, they're red in color. Um, they have a sort of a funny upturned mouth uh, or, or a mouth here. Uh, and these are fish that occur in uh, relatively deep water, um, you know, uh, 500, uh, 600, 700 uh, meters water depth. And these uh, ruffy live on deep seamounts. We know what seamounts are. Seamounts are volcanic uh, uh, features uh, that are covered with water but have a rocky substratum. And so ruffy uh, like to live on these seamounts. And uh, that's where they, you know, their population is, is adapted to live and they can have relatively high numbers. But what happened uh, back in the late 70s and uh, early 80s is that using acoustic uh, mapping techniques, and we've talked about 
different kinds of acoustic mapping techniques, SWOT mapping and BDRs and so forth. Uh, the governments of Australia and New Zealand mapped out where all of the seamounts were. And uh, this mapping project revealed where these roughy habitat uh, would occur. And so fishermen from New Zealand and Australia, starting in the mid 1990s, you know, really began to hammer um, uh, the uh, Rhone's roughy population. And there was a huge run up in roughy landings. And here you can see that the country that was catching the most orange roughy was Australia. Um, you know, followed by New Zealand and then other countries were in on the picture as well. Okay, but there's a problem with orange roughy as a fisheries uh, species. It is a very slow growing species. Uh, unlike Peruvian anchovy, which grow to maturity in, you know, uh, less than a year and die after two years, the orange roughy can live for in excess of 100 years. And it requires almost 50 years for a uh, individual uh, roughy to reach reproductive maturity. And it takes you know, another couple of decades after that to have a large female that produces the numbers of eggs that sustain the population. Um, so with that kind of a uh, life history with long period to maturity, um, uh, you know, long lived, um, that's not a fishery, not a population that's going to be able to snap back the way that um, uh, anchovy, for example, can recover from a, an impact. And so uh, you can see that the response of um, uh, the fish populations across this area was to decrease sharply. And, you know, we went from, you know, uh, um, you know uh, sort of uh, 120,000 tons by the 1990s down to about uh, 20,000 total tons in 2006. And the fishery, the orange roughy fishery has uh, in many cases collapsed. You can still, however, buy orange roughy at, at Publix. And any student of mine who ever buys orange roughy uh, will know that uh, uh, I'm angry with you. <laughs> Don't buy orange roughy. This is not a sustainable fishery, uh, despite the fact that they have um, certified fishing sign on there. This is not something that uh, we should be eating, although it's frozen and available for sale. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, eating fish. Uh, we've got a few minutes left here, uh, and then I'll have more to say in the lecture on Thursday. Um, but um, you know, if we think about seafood, and you know, many of us love seafood. I eat fish. Uh, I don't eat uh, chicken or, or, uh, or uh, pork or meat, uh, but I do eat fish, uh, shrimp, and, and uh, tilapia, and so forth. So many people like fishing, but like to eat uh, seafood, and seafood is sort of a, a luxury item, and it's very popular here in Florida. But if we look at changes over this, at the seafood menu over time, uh, we can see that there have been some pretty significant changes. So here's a Long John Silver. This is a chain, a restaurant. And if you look here, yeah, they, they're, they're fish here, but actually there's not a lot of variety. You know, there's shrimp, and then there's sort of breaded chunks of fish. Um, and, you know, but not, a, not a, a wide variety of different fish types. Basically, you're taking the same fish product and preparing it and serving it in different ways. So what are these products? And if you go to a restaurant, um, you know, and you look at the menu, so here's a menu from a, a fish restaurant that I went to, and they say fish. Well, um, you know, a flounder, uh, you know, a real fishing, you know, in the olden days, a real seafood restaurant would offer you, you know, flounder, halibut, cod, uh, different kind of fish. And here they're just saying large fish, medium fish, small fish. And then you look up here at what the choices are, whitting, tilapia, trout, or catfish. As a matter of fact, these are all, with the exception of witty, um, these are all uh, farm-raised fish. So trout, catfish, and tilapia are all aquaculture products. Flounder is a large um, you know, wild-caught fish. Shrimp, of course, are wild caught, although increasingly shrimp are farmed as well. Um, so the menu of available fish has really decreased with this downward shifting of the baseline, and that um, can be seen in these um, changes in the menu. Uh, 
Now, this is not a scientific result. I haven't surveyed all of the fishing menus uh, for different seafood restaurants everywhere. Um, but this is a sort of an anecdotal general impression formed. Um, you can still buy uh, fish um, uh, burgers at um, fast food restaurants. And these burgers have a name. It's called a fish fillot. F-I-L-L-O-T. Well, we know what a fillet is, F-I-L-L-E-T. This is a piece of fish, you know, removed with the bones that's been removed. A fillet is actually not um, that. The way they make fillet is they take this uh, fish here. This is a fish called Alaska Pollock. It's a soft bodied fish. Um, you know, if you put one on your plate, you know, it wouldn't be all that tempting, but it's very good for industrial fish processing. So they take this uh, fish and um, the elastic pollock are landed in, in huge, huge quantities. Uh, when I was young, I worked on a, as a fisheries inspector for NOAA, and I was out on uh, fishing boats where they would catch, you know, tons of pollock in a single haul. They use a certain kind of trawl net to do that. <clears throat> they would have to be careful not to continue fishing too long because if they fill their nets too full, they wouldn't be able to um, um, land them, bring them onto the ships. But what McDonald's does is it takes this pollock and it macerates it up, sort of grinds it up, adds emulsifiers and other ingredients, and reconstitutes it as this little um, fish fillet uh, and um, serves that on a bun with cheese and tartar sauce. Yum, yum. And so that's the fish fillet. And it's, you know, the pollock is a reasonably sustainable fish. Um, as a, as a, a component of diet, uh, I don't recommend it, but um, um, that's what it is. And of course, everything is breaded and fried, so it has a sort of a uniform taste. Okay, well, I think I'll stop there. Um, and uh, this, of course, has been recorded, and uh, I'll put the, the feature out there. Let me stop and uh, take questions, uh, if anybody has any questions and um, we'll go from there. So I will stop talking. Uh, we'll be more on fishing uh, and fish um, uh, management and fish science uh, on the Thursday's lecture, and there'll be a quiz over today's lecture and Thursday's lecture um, posted uh, when I finish this course. So the uh, floor is open for questions. Please ask me any questions at all. Why didn't the U.S. sign the EEZ? Yeah, good question. Uh, it wasn't about fish. This was during the Reagan era. And um, the concern was that the EEZ, you know, the, the law of the sea covered not just fishing, but also um, the possibility of uh, ocean mining. And uh, if you, in chapter 17, they talk about uh, resources from the sea and they talk about manganese nodules. Well, back in the time when they were negotiating that, it was thought that maybe manganese nodules would be a big growth industry for the United States. Um, and so there were a lot of business interests that lobbied strongly against the law of the sea and it sort of got bogged down. Uh, so the, the United States was a signatory to the law of the sea, but the treaty was never ratified by the U.S. Senate um, because of, um, of uh, economic uh, complaints or economic uh, protests. Um, the uh, uh, the United States abides by the exclus exclusive economic zone and enforces its own EEZ, um, but many other aspects of the law of the sea uh, are, not, um, are not enforced. We're not a signatory to that. And so that has consequences sort of in terms of international relations. Other questions? Uh, well, I'm, I miss the uh, the feedback that I, I get from looking at your faces and and uh, you know being able to ask you questions and have you raise your hand and all that. I, I miss that in exchange, um, but I'm hoping that this uh, process of uh, online lectures is is working for you all, and I will um, uh, post this and I'll be ready to answer questions. And Carrie and I will be. Uh, uh, getting the sign-up sheet ready to go uh, for your milestone three. And I encourage you all to work as your teams and try to get ready for that. But I ensure you that we will work with each team uh, to get your uh, submission in a tip shop shape. And so you'll be ready to, to fill the requirements of this team project.
Okay, I'm going to stop um, sharing at this point, and I'll post the recording to this uh, online, and there'll be a quiz uh, later. And of course, you can always email me if you have any questions. All right.